All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Interstellar Probe Study webinar series. My name is James Mistandria, and I'm the Assistant Project Manager for the Interstellar Probe Study, and will be the host for today's webinar. We have a wonderful panel presentation today on the circumstellar dust disk, ground truth for planetary formation. And after the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. Before we start today's presentation, I would like to outline the logistics of today's event. As a member of the audience, your audio and video are off. During the presentation, please submit your questions in the question and answer feature. You may also upvote questions. During the question and answer session, I will start with questions with the most upvotes and proceed down the list. And now let's introduce today's speakers. Casey Liss is an astronomer at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. He has over 37 years of experience in the fields of astronomy, astrophysics, detector physics, and development, and remote sensing data analysis. His current research focuses on studying the formation and evolution of solar systems by studying dust, gas, asteroids, and comets orbiting the host star. He's been involved in many NASA missions and most recently is a member of the New Horizons science team, is a member of the SphereX science team, and is on the Spitzer Space Telescope Extended Science Team. Andrew Poppy is an associate research scientist at the Space Sciences Lab at the University of California at Berkeley. He received his PhD in physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder in 2011. As a graduate student, he worked on the New Horizons student dust counter under the direction of Professor Mihai Harani, and since graduating, has continued his research into the origins, dynamics, and implications of interplanetary dust populations throughout the solar system. In addition to interplanetary dust science, he studies plasma interactions with various solar system moons, and in 2016 was named the NASA Planetary Science Early Career Fellow for his work studying Ganymede's mini magnetosphere. Professor Mihai Harani received his MS degree in nuclear physics and a PhD in space physics at the Lorand Edvos University in Budapest, Hungary. He joined the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, LASP, in 1992 and the Physics Department in 1999 at the University of Colorado, Colorado at Boulder. His research interests include theoretical and experimental investigations of space and laboratory dusty plasmas. He served as a co-investigator for the dust instruments on board the Ulysses, Galileo, and Cassini missions. As a principal investigator for the dust instrument built by LASP, the student dust counter on board New Horizons, the cosmic dust experiment on board the Ames satellite, and the lunar dust experiment on board the LADEE mission. He is the principal investigator for the interstellar dust experiment on board the upcoming IMAP mission, and he is a fellow of both the American Physical Society and the American, and the American Geophysical Union. And now, Casey, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, James, for that wonderful introduction. So my name is Dr. Kerry Liss. Uh, I also go by Casey. I work at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And my job today is to introduce our two wonderful speakers coming up next, Dr. Andrew Poppy and Professor Mihai Haryani. Both of them are gonna talk about the dust, some of the dust science, dust science that can be done with an interstellar probe that is going to fly from our earth, as you see in this picture, through the region of the planets, past the, uh, the region where the solar wind uh, influences the environment around the planets through the edge of that uh, what we call the heliosheath and heliopause and into the virgin galaxy into the nearby galaxy there are dust whoop go back please there are dust in through those three different environments you see a little bit one two and three here there's dust between the planets there's dust in what we call the heliosheath and the heliopause at the end of our solar winds bubble and there's dust in the nearby galaxy all of which we think is in different environments behaving differently um, we only know about the dust directly in the first environment so next slide please uh, what can we infer from the dusts in these three different environments? Well, if you look in the extreme left, upper left, you'll see these are dust disks that we see around other stars. You can see they come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Um, these are mainly young stars that have a lot of dust early on because they're still forming and collecting their dust into bodies known as planets and asteroids and comets. But there's some older ones here too. Uh, Andrew's going to talk about this a lot more. In the lower left, you see measurement of the dust that we see glowing in the thermal infrared radiation when we fly a spacecraft with uh, infrared spectrometers and imagers around the Earth. And this would be from Spitzer, from IRAS, or from COBE. And you see two main things when you look in the sky in thermal infrared um, eyes. You see one uh, along the x-axis here is the yellow and the green and the red is the very bright hot emission from our galaxy. There's lots of dust in our galaxy between the stars. 
And secondly, you see what looks like that kind of electric blue boomerang or the mark of Z Zorro. That is the solar system, the dust in our ecliptic plane. That's what we call this zodiacal cloud. It's also known as the dust between the planets. Because this isn't a galactic coordinate frame, the ecliptic plane looks like it's that Z. If you put it in the ecliptic plane, it would be nice and flat and smooth. And so we know there's lots of dust out there. And we measured it with other probes that have gone through the dust. And so we expect ISP will go and look at this. And Andrew's going to talk about this in a lot more detail. Secondly, we've never actually taken any sort of dust counters or analyzers through into the second region and through the edge of our the bubble that's created by our sun, solar wind, and the heliosheath and the heliopause. So we can only look at other stars. And we look at other stars, we see light scattered UV light in these images here. You see in the middle from Myra or from the IRC 10216 in the bottom right, that is light scattering from dust that's either being uh, around in a big bubble or being entrained and thrown back behind the star as it moves through the local galaxy, galactic medium. Or we see in thermal infrared eyes at 70 microns of Spitzer, we see huge glowing arcs. We see lots of dust where the, the, the rubber meets the road, where the wind meets the galaxy. So we can expect a lot in, our, in our, the edges of our system. And finally, when we go back on the right, oops, back one, please. Um, let's go back again. We know that there's, remember, there's dust in the galaxy. I showed you that image when we were talking about the first region. Go back to that again. We know there's dust there. And if we look lower right with remote sensing, we get a good idea that we actually can see when we look at lines of sight to stars, we see absorption due to dust. So we have a very good idea that there is dust throughout the galaxy and even in the local galaxy. Next, please. So how are we going to measure this dust? Well, there's two major different ways. One is we're going to do what we call in situ. ISP is going to have instruments that are going to collect dust particles as the spacecraft is moving, as the dust particles come in and hit it. And it's going to do three, it has three different counters, three different ways of doing that. One is a dust counter, very much like what we found on New Horizon. You see this goldish picture in the upper left. And that's a piece of charged plastic, if you will, where a particle comes in and it knocks out a piece of the plastic and creates an electrical pulse and gets counted. And this is good for the, looking and measuring the numbers of the largest particles, particles that are maybe tens of microns up to a few microns. Secondly, in the upper right, we're going to fly something that's never gone past the orbit of Saturn. We're going to fly what we call a dust analyzer. Something that's going, an instrument's going to take a particle, have it come in, slam into a metal target, and uh, ionize at high velocities. And it's going to kick off ions that are then going to be sent through across E and B fields and are going to be analyzed um, for where they land. It's going to tell us the, the charge to mass ratio and tell us the number of each atom that's in the dust. And from that, we can tell what the dust was made of. For example, was it a carbonaceous particle or lots of organics, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen? Or was it a rocky particle, a lot of silicon, oxygen, magnesium, and iron in it? And this is a very exciting. This is being built for missions, uh, new missions to Jupiter. And we're going to adopt the same kind of instrument, that state of the art. And you're going to hear about that in the second talk. Um, oh, not done yet. And thirdly, there's going to have a neutral mass spectrometer at the bottom, which is going to look at the very smallest particles. And it's going to, particles barely bigger than molecule, and it's going to go detect them. Okay, next slide, please. Secondly, we're going to use remote sensing. We're going to use a spectrometer and imager combination in the infrared, just like I showed you what has been done around the Earth. And we're going to use that to map the whole sky. Rather than just dust just hitting the spacecraft, we're going to be able to look at dust far away all across the solar system. And then once we're out in the galaxy, all across the galaxy. I don't have time to go into this, but I do have time to tell you that this is basically taking all the work that's been done in the 70s and 80s and 90s with infrared spectrometers and imagers around the Earth and taking it out to places they've never been before. Very exciting places. Next, please. So in summary, we know that ISP is going to enable groundbreaking solar system, heliosheath, and galactic ISM dust science. What is it going to do? It's going to measure the distribution of circumstellar dust in total from the Earth all the way out into the galaxy. It's going to actually walk through and get a cord and measure. And for the first time, it's going to take a dust chemical analyzer. It's actually not going to just hit numbers. It's actually going to get composition. We're going to see, for example, is there ice in Kuiper Belt dust? Uh, Andrew will talk about that a lot more. Secondly, it will measure dust in the heliosheath, which we, again, with the first chemical analyzer encounter that's ever been taken there. We have no idea how much dust is there. And whether there's, if there's a lot of dust, it could very much change the physics of what's going on in the heliosheath. Uh, a dusty plasma is acts very differently than just a gas-only plasma. And third, we're going to go and take this dust chemical analyzer into the nearby galaxy, and we're going to get pristine dust. We're actually going to get the dust that we think is the input into making the, our planets. We're not gonna get dust that's been filtered out by magnetic fields or possibly polluted by everything that creates dust in the solar system. We're actually gonna to get to the ground truth, the original recipe for what makes stars and planets. So I've gone on a long time. Um, you've got two wonderful talks coming up. 
Um, the plots in the, you see in the bottom on the lower left is what dust we think we measured with New Horizons that's in our solar system. In the center is the dust that we're going to see in the helio sheets. And on the right, you're in here at some length. This is the dust we think that's in the galaxy. And there's some real controversy over what's going on versus what we measure versus what we think is there. Thank you very much. And please listen with great enthusiasm to the next two talks by Andrew Pape and Mihai Harani. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Casey. Uh, my name is Andrew Poppy. I'm an associate research scientist at the Space Sciences Laboratory at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and for my portion of today's seminar, I'll be talking about uh, studying interplanetary dust uh, and what I like to call taking the big picture uh, with interstellar probe and how this is a really exciting development to be able to constrain the first of these populations that Casey talked about, which is the dust inside the planetary system. So next slide, please. So how do we know that there's any dust between the stars, or excuse me, between the planets? Well, we can actually see it with our own eyes. Um, so an image I show here uh, was actually taken from the top of the Mauna Kea uh, volcano in Hawaii. Uh, and I first point out uh, what's called galactic light. That's what many of us are probably familiar with as the Milky Way. Uh, but in addition, I've outlined in this white box uh, a very faint signal that you can see that runs horizontally uh, across the sky. Uh, that is actually what we call zodiacal light. Uh, that is sunlight from our sun scattering off dust grains that are in between the planets. Uh, and this has actually been known for several hundred years. You can observe it on very dark uh, nights if you live in a place with a dark sky. Uh, and it's actually uh, was long theorized and then later shown to be really truly due to uh, dust uh, in between the planets. And so by studying this signal from 1AU, uh, in other words, from Earth, um, we've been able to discern a lot of the characteristics about dust um, near the Earth's orbit at 1AU. Uh, but naturally, this begs the question of, OK, if we understand the dust right at Earth's orbit, what does it look like through the rest of the solar system? And in fact, if we go to the next slide, please, um, we can take a very different perspective of dust. And Casey uh, referred to this figure uh, very early on. These are images of what we call exozodiacal dust disks or dust disks around other stars. Uh, and if you take a minute to sort of like glance through uh, the various images here, you see that they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, they sometimes have very thin, um, well-defined rings. Sometimes they're more amorphous and spread out. Uh, if you stare long enough and closely enough at some of these, you'll start to notice asymmetry. Sometimes it's shifted to one side or the other. All of these, these detailed features are telling us something about the planetary systems that are either being formed or evolving later in their lifetimes around each of these stars. And really that starts to beg the question of, okay, we know there's dust at 1AU from our observations on the ground. And we know when we look at exozodiacal disks around other stars that we see lots of dust scattering light. So really where does our solar system fit in if we were to take a big picture of our uh, solar system's dust disk. And this naturally has led to several scientific questions. If we go to the next slide, I'll pull out three of these. First off, for our solar system, what are the dominant sources of interplanetary dust in the solar system? Where does all this dust come from? If we wanna understand that, then we need to ask the question of what are the observables beyond 1AU, beyond Earth's orbit, that would help us further constrain models. And I talk about these models in a few slides. Uh, and finally, after we've answered both of these first questions, we can circle back to the third question and finally understand how our solar system's debris disk fits in with these other observed exozodiacal disks. So where do we fit in in the family picture? Who are we standing next to? Next slide, please. So after many decades of research, we believe we have a decent idea of where dust in interplanetary space is coming from. And I've shown here graphically five of the most prominent sources. They include asteroids, uh, things like in the main belt asteroid, things like uh, in near-Earth asteroids. The second one is from Jupiter family comets. Um, shown here is comet 9P Temple 1. Um, we know from observations that these tend to um, be prodigious sources of dust as they approach the sun, heat up, they volatilize and lose dust and gas. We also have things like Halley-type comets. It's perhaps the most well-known comet. Um, that also is known to shed dust. Similarly, Oort cloud comets, shown in the fourth uh, panel. Uh, these are actually a very unique set of comets. These are comets that are very, very far out on the edge of the solar system. They are barely held gravitationally to the sun. Uh, but every once in a while, one of them will come screaming into the inner solar system. They will dump a lot of dust. 
uh, and, and be a, another significant source uh, of, of inter, uh, interplanetary dust. Uh, finally, uh, has really been shown by the New Horizons mission, and I'll talk about in detail additionally uh, in some later slides, is uh, dust that's coming from the Edrith Kuiper Belt. So the Edrith Kuiper Belt is sort of the relic planetesimal belt that's outside the orbit of Neptune. Uh, is explored uh, first by the New Horizons mission, it's flyby by Pluto, later by the object Arakoth. And we believe that through a variety of processes, mostly likely collisions between different Edric Kuiper Belt objects, that these are continually producing dust in the outer solar system that then migrates around. The three of these that I've outlined in, in uh, white borders include the Jupiter family comets, Oort cloud comets, and Edric Kuiper Belt objects. These three are, at least today, believed to be the primary sources in terms of density and number flux for interplanetary dust grains in the solar system. So those three populations are mainly what I'll be focusing on for the balance of the talk. Next slide, please. So much of my work in the past decade has been to take these sources, the Edward Kuiper Belt objects, Oort cloud comets, Jupiter family comets, and to use computer models to trace how the dust grains uh, originating from these objects will migrate around the solar system and how they end up with their equilibrium distributions, their velocity distributions, and how they might impact or interact with other planetary bodies in the solar system. And each of these sources, because they're coming from different regions in the solar system, end up having different spatial distributions of interplanetary dust. So on the left figure, you see um, the model prediction for where the dust is concentrated from Edward Kuiper Belt objects. I've denoted the orbits of Neptune and Jupiter, respectively. And here you can see the brightest colors of the greatest density for Kuiper Belt object dust is actually outside the orbit of Neptune. And that generally makes sense because that's where the source bodies primarily are. You can also, however, see that that Edward Kuiper Belt dust tends to diffuse throughout the solar system, even all the way down into inside Jupiter's orbit. In the center, I show Oort cloud comets. I mentioned earlier that these generally originate from the far outer solar system. They're on high eccentricity orbits that come screaming in, and they dump a lot of dust all along their trajectory as they're coming into the inner solar system. And this, the model would predict, generally yields uh, what we call a more isotropic signal. It tends to just be spread out over all space, but it does tend to decline as you go farther out, out into the outer solar system past Neptune. Finally, in the rightmost panel, you see dust from Jupiter family comets. As the name implies, these are associated dynamically with Jupiter itself. Uh, they are primarily located in the inner solar system. So you can see by contrast that much of the dust from Jupiter family comets is deep inside the solar system's gravitational well, mainly inside the orbit of Jupiter. Now, these are the model predictions for what yeah, each component contributes, but we really want to uh, put quantitative numbers to this. We want to understand how much of each of these different sources is going into the total uh, distribution of dust in the, in the solar system. In the next slide, please, we'll talk about how we actually go about um, putting numbers to these. Uh, we add in situ measurements, and much of the work that's been done in the last decade has come from an instrument on board uh, the New Horizons mission uh, called SDC, or the Student Dust Counter. Uh, it was originally built uh, at LASP at the University of Colorado at Boulder. It was very unique in that it was a student-led, student-designed, and student-operated mission. Uh, and it's been very successful in counting the density of uh, interplanetary dust grains as New Horizons has left Earth at 1 AU. Uh, and actually just, I believe earlier this week, it passed the milestone of 50 AU, or 50 times the distance between the sun and the Earth. So it is very far out into the outer solar system. Along its way out, the student dust counter has been patiently recording the impact of these dust grains. That's the figure that's shown on the right. The black uh, data points are actually measurements from the student dust counter. And by tracing the path of, of New Horizons through these different models that I just presented, we can actually tell um, that the primary contribution to the count rates on the student dust counter must be coming from the Edrith Kuiper Belt. And it's really exciting. We're finally detecting this dust that's being generated out past the orbit of Neptune, and, and New Horizons is flying through it. And we're able to put quantitative numbers to how much dust we think is there. Um, but admittedly, there are fairly large error bars to these. Uh, New Horizons is actually only measuring a very small size range from about a half micron to five microns in radius of the dust grain. Uh, and so we don't typically know anything about larger grains, larger than 10 microns or so. And so we're missing a big component of what you call the big picture. Next slide, please. Uh, and in fact, 
what what uh, we believe we're missing is actually sort of what the total amount of dust is. We have this this measurement, this very valuable measurement by the student dust counter down at small grain sizes. Um, but if we take the model and we we go one step further and we ask, okay, we've used New Horizons to set the overall uh, values of what we think uh, is the best fit to the data. Where is all the dust in the solar system if we if we extrapolate this model? And it yields actually a, a somewhat surprising and curious prediction. Uh, in the figure I'm showing here, um, I have an observer who's walking from the inner solar system at 0.1 AU all the way out to 500 AU, far, far outside the solar system. And as you're going out, you're counting up how much dust um, you've passed already. And what's interesting is that much of the dust is actually located, at least as predicted by the model, in the outer solar system. In fact, for reference, I've drawn the 1% dust line, and it happens to occur at 15 AU, which is outside the orbit of Saturn. So in reality, you have to get all the way past Saturn to even have measured 1% of the solar system's dust disk mass. It means that on the, on, on the opposite sense, 99% of the dust mass in the solar system is actually beyond the orbit of Saturn. If you look at beyond the orbit of Neptune at 30 AU, that number is about 70% of the dust. That's a surprising prediction, and I, and I emphasize that this is a model prediction. We don't necessarily know if this is correct. Um, there are some extrapolations to get to this calculation. What we'd really like to do is to test this model prediction, and this is really where interstellar probe starts to come in. Next slide, please. So one way in which to, to um, transition from just doing the in-situ dust detections to something that can get us to larger grain sizes and larger um, regions in the solar system is to look at what's called thermal emission from dust grains. So anytime a dust grain is at a given temperature, it will radiate a little bit of heat, right? Uh, and the heat translates into uh, certain wavelengths. Uh, and by looking at different wavelengths, we can actually probe different temperatures of dust. Now, typically the farther out in the solar system you go, the colder thing gets, uh, the colder the dust grains get, and then the longer wavelength you see. So in this uh, figure, I show five uh, predicted uh, brightness emissions from various sizes of dust grains. Uh, in five micron wavelengths, you're seeing uh, what is relatively warm dust in the inner solar system. As you go to 10, 50, 100, 200, and 500 microns, you're looking at longer and longer wavelength signals, which are coming from colder and colder dust. And so what you see is that at the longer wavelength, say at about 100 microns, you're actually very sensitive to the brightness that's coming from the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt. You can very clearly see this nice ring uh, in emission that's formed by this cold dust. This is essentially what we would want to measure with interstellar probe, or one of the things we would want to measure with interstellar probe. And by measuring this brightness against the background sky, we can actually look at this big picture of interplanetary dust. So how exactly is interstellar probe going to enable this? That is on the next slide, please. <clears throat> We're going to enable this by helping to put um, our solar system in context um, with uh, other stars. So I took a collection of these, or these, this is a, a figure from Wyatt, 2008, um, where there are a collection of, of solar system debris disks. And what we see is that, in fact, uh, the youngest stars, um, which are over on the upper left, tend to be the brightest. There's a lot of active planetary formation going on, lots of asteroids smashing into each other, lots of comets dumping dust into the inner solar system of these planetary systems. But generally, as the uh, planetary systems age, and we get out to something like the four uh, billion years that our own solar system is, they tend to dim a lot. Uh, and so the question is, where on this plot is our solar system once we've taken this big picture um, with interstellar probe? On the next slide, please, uh, is actually what we think we, we would like to measure on the way out with interstellar probe. Um, so there's in situ dust detection. This is where you're actually watching the or, or feeling for the dust grains to impact the detector. Um, that'll be in, in uh, Mihai Hirani's talk in the next slide. Um, but what I will briefly talk about is what's called remote infrared imaging. Uh, if you take a camera that's capable of looking in these outer uh, long wavelengths, you can actually measure as the interstellar probe goes out of the solar system, how much brightness is in the sky. Uh, and so on the left figure, I've shown sort of a simple cartoon picture. You can see in the solid arrow is the interstellar probe trajectory um, straight out of the solar system along a cord. And if the imager is looking at sort of a canted angle as we go out, you can actually map out the integrated brightness that is seen. And then there are tricks, mathematical tricks to invert that and to tell you what this big structure looks like. 
we can then take those measurements with the infrared. We can go back to the models and say, oh yes, there actually is 99% of dust in the outer solar system. Or maybe we find out that actually it's, it's far less than that. And the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt is really good at making small grains, but not necessarily these large grains. These are all the types of questions that we can get at with these types of instruments from Interstellar Probe. And it really is an exciting, I'd say once in a generation opportunity to take this big picture uh, of the interplanetary dust disk. So on the next slide, um, I'll wrap up with some conclusions. Like I said, this is really an exciting opportunity um, to, to measure along a direct cord as Interstellar Probe exits the solar system. Um, what I think is important to touch on between my talk, which is you know, a little bit more on the remote sensing, uh, and the next talk, which will be a little bit more about the in situ, is that combining both of these detection types is actually very powerful. You can measure what's right at the spacecraft with the in situ, and you can compare that to the remote sensing and have sort of a ground truth and a distant truth to get really a good picture of this, the interplanetary dust disk. And finally, what's really important, I think, to, to connect to the broader picture is how to place our solar system in sort of this family portrait of zodiacal disks. Where are we compared to everybody else? Are we a dust poor solar system? Are we a dust rich solar system? What does that tell us about planetary formation? How is it that we ended up with all of the planetary systems that we do versus what we see in other systems? So it's a really big opportunity by measuring something local in our solar system to really connect to the broader picture of other planetary systems in the galaxy. That's all for my talk. I will hand it over to Professor Mihai Hirani from here to give the second half of the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mihai Horani. I am at the University of Colorado. Um, I would um, try to remind you that, of course, we learned a lot about the universe around us by making remote sensing observations, and you are used to measuring electrons and ions, and you could also argue about the value of measuring dust measurements. But I would like to start a quote that dust carries a lot more than uh, just the curiosity of a dust disk and the structure of it. Dust particles like photons are born at remote sites and space and time. From knowledge of the dust particles, burst place and their bulk properties, we can learn about the remote environment out of which the particles were formed. That's a, a, a paper Eberhard Grün uh, wrote some years ago. Next, please. Well, we already touched upon by in the talk of Casey and Andrew that we started out five billion years ago or so with a very dust rich environment uh, out of the collapsing uh, dust and gas, we form planetesimals, the planetesimals build planets, the nebula dispersed, and we ended up with a very empty inner solar system. And of course, there are surviving planetesimals and comets and asteroids today, and also interstellar dust flowing through the solar system. So maybe we could learn about the raw materials, the minerals, and the organics by making dust measurements. Next. It's so, you know, it's safe to start with the decadal survey. And of course, there's a new one coming. A lot of, a lot of you are working on a new de uh, decadal survey, but the questions posed are by all means not closed. So I, I expect a lot of these questions that we're gonna discuss in the next couple of minutes in some shape and form will be addressed in the new survey. For example, what were the initial stages, conditions, and processes of solar system formation? And what is the nature of interstellar matter that was incorporated? Where were the primordial sources of organic matter? And people re realized that small bodies, comets and asteroids might hold the answer because they probably contain material to, to, that is processed to a lesser extent than uh, you know, if you were to visit a planet. But, of course, comparing interstellar dust today with interplanetary dust today, we have to realize that there is a lot of chemical evolution and processing happened inside the solar system. A lot of ha happened in, in the galactic um, chemical evolution. And the task at, at hand is to figure out that these, what we measure today, can we conclude? that the building blocks of our solar system is from interstellar space. And can we understand the environment that we live in today? 
So comets and asteroids are excellent targets and several missions are going to visit these objects. But the Dickinson survey already pointed out there are way too many of these. You cannot visit all of them. <laughs> but what you could do as a complementary approach is measure the common pool of material that they shed in the solar system, interplanetary dust. I cannot tell you which object it came from, which specific comet that particle came from. But as we traverse the solar system, we could probably tell you whether it is from Jupiter Camille comets or Oort cloud comets or what, what sort of a, a source, family of source particles this could come from. Next. For example, dust measurements can tell you whether the composition of the contemporary local interstellar cloud population is consistent or not with being the feedstock of the formation of the solar system. This is the two track, the chemical track within and the chemical track outside. Are they consistent with one another? What do you need to do? Well, you should be able to identify telepart interstellar and interplanetary dust. You should probably, you're curious about uh, the density and size distribution. And also what sort of uh, composition are you gonna find rock forming minerals or elemental abundances, how these two regions in space containing dust compare. Next. Uh, you could determine whether cometary dust indeed preserve unprocessed pre-solar molecular cloud particles, or, you know, they show significant processing in the solar system by exposure to heat or dust, uh, I'm sorry, heat or, <laughs> or, or water. Uh, on, on the bottom right, I show you an interplanetary dust particle, what we believe it's collected on the U2's flights. And some of them clearly contain material with isotopic composition that is very non-solar. And people argue that, aha, uh -huh, these are in fact original interstellar particles. We know them, we identify them because their makeup is unusual. But the question begs, are these the rare few that survive and they still get the fingerprint or isotopic fingerprint of the star they came from, as opposed to the many more uh, larger population of interstellar particles that were destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and reprocessed countless times as they are contributing to the dust content of, uh, of our galactic environment. What you need to do, of course, is you'd like to identify what sort of a comet family a dust particle comes from. You would like to see, if you can, the mineralogy and the minor constituents. And certainly, for example, if iron is, uh, is metal or oxide or sulfide, or what, what does it tell you about the level of processing uh, these grains uh, encode as you fly across the solar system? Next. That's a, that's a very challenging one, of course, is uh, whether organics from asteroids or various cometary families, they all look alike, the organic content is similar, or they are really carrying organic material from distinct reservoirs. For that, you would need to, again, clearly identify and tell apart interplanetary versus interstellar dust and look at the functional organic functional groups and try to figure out whether there are groupings or they all look alike regardless of the source body. Next. So why would interstellar probe help and what sort of instruments have we today that we could think about flying? Uh, next. About interstellar dust in the heliosphere, we know about the Ulysses measurements in 92, Ulysses flew by Jupiter and took a south uh, dive to get into a solar polar orbit. And it monitored, identified interstellar dust and trained in the flow of interstellar gas flying through the solar system. And through, you know, it's uh, 14 or 15 years of monitoring interstellar dust, it noticed that the flux is changing that the flux measured by Ulysses is changing, which is probably a doing of the heliospheric magnetic field or plasma environment. It's unlikely that our galactic environment is changing in dust content in such a short period of time. Also the directionality of these particles shifted around 
which clearly indicates the doing of the large-scale heliospheric magnetic fields. You would argue that if you look at the pie chart above, why are we so excited about uh, interstellar dust? It's only a couple percentile of the total matter that comes from interstellar space and goes through the solar system. I have to tell you because what we learn from dust, all these processes and the level of processing and the, the makeup of them has tremendous bearing on our understanding how our solar system came about. Next. It's difficult. Interstellar dust measurement is difficult. On the left is the fluxes reported as a function of distance from the sun of various spacecraft, Cassini, Ulysses, Galileo, and Helios. And notice there is a tendency that uh, the closer you are to the sun, the, the, few, the less the flux is reduced. Uh, also, of course, it's kind of an interesting story in the history of our, of our field that the Ulysses measurements were done in 92, the Galileo measurements and the Helios measurements were done much earlier, but based on the Ulysses discovery at Jupiter, our colleagues went back and reanalyzed some of that old data, and there it is, they identified interstellar dust. The reason that measurement is difficult, because in the middle, I show you what happens against radiation pressure, that has the same radial dependence as gravity, so the instead of being focused or just go flowing through the solar system, some of the interstellar grains, depending on their composition and size, will never make it to the inside of our solar system. On the very right is, is a measurement by Ulysses in blue dots, and in black, the carbon and silica contribution of the total interstellar dust as a function of grain size or grain mass. And the next step, uh, I want to bring your attention that there is a tremendous lack of small particles. You know, we are orders and orders of magnitude below what was measured. There is, a, there is some level of understanding. We know why that might be, because at the heliospheric boundary, the tiny particles where the magnetic field is piled up from the solar wind, these particles will never come across. They are diverted to flow around the heliosphere. So it would be very curious if this is indeed the case to fly across this region and tell you, oh my gosh, the number of small particles are skyrocketing at this interface. It's even more puzzling, next, is the right side. Because the Ulysses report a lot more large particles, micron and few micron sized particles, than the models of what we, sh we think should be in interstellar space based on stellar extinction and polarization measurements. So we have a problem. We have a problem to reconcile decades or centuries of optical observations and this single data collected by Ulysses telling you that there is more dust seams or larger of particles than you think there are in interstellar space. The way to reconcile that difficulty is to go and make a measurement. Next, uh, Andrew already mentioned the student dust counter. There are 12 of these little plastic panels. There are a couple behind for uh, telling you if we measure noise versus dust hit. And every part time a particle hits you, it generates an electrical signal. That's a function of both mass and speed. But I only make one measurement, so we have to make an assumption, and that's actually not a reason, not an unreasonable one. That that speed is dominated by the spacecraft as it flies across uh, the dust environment. Next, that's all the data we have so far. That's heliocentric distance at various mass cutoff, particles bigger than 1.4, bigger than 0.9, or bigger than just 0.6 micron. Those are the tiny ones and the density in units of cubic kilometers. The next step shows you that even though Voyager did not carry a dedicated dust instrument, its electrical antennas recognize a sharp or, or a very fast pulse when dust particles hit the spacecraft. And that's kind of a poor man or Anyway, that, that's kind of a, a multi-use of an instrument that is dedicated to make plasma measurements, but you could use also the entire body of the spacecraft 
to, to uh, as a counter. You cannot tell really how big the particle was, but comparing to the student dust counter measurements, we are on the same page, which in this business is remarkable. <laughs> Next. So that's now in terms of flux against heliocentric distance. These are all particles bigger than about half a micron in the radius or so. The blue dots are our measurements already or nearly 50 AU. This data is just a couple of weeks old. And then the two models you could compare with. One is Andrews, the previous speaker, and an older one for Vitense. And uh, you could argue that the red seems to be performing better, but we should see what's coming next. And actually next is interesting because the next step in this slide shows you that at some point we're gonna run out of Kuiper belt dust and we're gonna be in interstellar space and what we can't and what we what we, we detect will be interstellar dust particles. Next. It would be great to tell you the composition and we had uh, two chances to date uh, to make in-situ interstellar measurements. Cassini identified 36 particles that are most likely interstellar. And of course, Stardust uh, reports seven candidates in the returned aerogels. But let me show you the best looking interstellar dust spectrum from Cassini as a function of uh, ion mass and arbitrary amplitudes. And then below that, is a modern uh, lab instrument, a chemical analyzer instrument, that if you can compare the mass resolution, you should be impressed because this nice uh, walled feature measured by Cassini around 20, 30 uh, Daltons, and this can now be resolved into a candidate particle that has would be similar features, and you see magnesium and silica and sulfur, and iron, and so forth. Next. So where is this incredible increase in uh, mass resolution come from? And of course, that's uh, the 30 year difference between the development of Cassini versus these new instruments. On the bottom, top left, you see the Cassini instrument. There is a small chemical target. If you hit there, uh, you generate an impact plasma and the ions can be separated by an acceleration grid and used in a time of flight setup. It's a linear time of flight setup and gives you a mass resolution M over delta M of about 30. These instruments that uh, you, could, uh, you could design today would make a much longer path by reversing the trajectories instead of a linear time of flight. These are reflecton time of flight setups. That is poorly electrostatics. And it gives you a focusing that compensates for the initial energy distribution of the ions. So the mass resolution becomes remarkably higher, almost an order of magnitude. And uh, that's a laboratory mass spectra. And the next step would show you or bring your attention to the target material, silver, with these two isotopes, 107, 109, clearly identified in the time of flight mass spectra. Next, if you want to know about minerals of various types and how to read in situ measurements, you need, just like with UV and IR spectra, you need laboratory truths. So for impact ionization, dust composition measurements, the lab setup involves a dust accelerator at the University of Colorado or earlier than, than this device, a dust ac accelerator at, uh, in Heidelberg at Max Planck Institute. The next slide shows you what is available as a function of mass on the y-axis and speed on the x-axis. We can shoot particles. Our speed record is about 120 kilometer per sec. Uh, that's the nature of the physics involved that uh, this diagonal structure, we could fill in the bottom uh, missing piece by lowering the accelerator voltage, but the physics is such that we cannot go higher and give you a very fast, very large particle. The next slide is the device at the accelerator impact chamber. The one on the left, that's uh, kind of a cylindrical setup, is the chemical analyzer. The one on the right is a set of grids that for large enough charges would measure the trajectory, uh, the vector, velocity vector of an incoming particle. 
next. For example, this is a couple of mineral examples, pyroxene. And you see the, the, the bottom boxes, the various regions uh, enlarged in mass on the x-axis, and you would recognize the various species that make up pyroxene. But these wiggly lines do not necessarily immediately tell you what was the incoming particle makeup. You need your laboratory setup or library to, at that speed, uh, the various candidate minerals spectra look like, and which is the one that looks the similar to the one that you are measuring in space. Next is an other particle, anartite. Uh, next, yeah, these libraries are being built as we speak. And as an example, to convince you that this is really working, this is a, a, a small 80 nanometer radius, 20 kilometer per sec speed orthopyroxene particle. And it is focused from uh, on, on the magnesium isotopes. Magnesium 24, magnesium 25, magnesium 26. And the line integral or the area under the integral tells you the fraction of those ions that are representing that isotopes. And then you could compare the measurement expected from our geo geochemistry colleagues to the measurements we made. But remember, this measurement was made on a single 80 nanometer radius, itty bitty tiny bit of dust and we are within a percentile of the expected composition. You could beat that down by, of course, averaging hundreds of particles and get a much more precise measurement of the isotopic makeup. Next. So what would you carry to answer or use these type of instruments on an interstellar probe? Certainly, you would like to have uh, cluster ions or neutrals, so on the very left, in a nanometer or few nanometer range, probably you would consider a Cassini ion neutron mass pack. In the mid range of you know tens of nanometers to maybe even up to a micron, you should sit seriously consider what a composition analyzer could contribute. For larger particles, a New Horizons SDC type instrument, and for the largest of all, where you could use the entire spacecraft body. And in any case, probably our fields and particles colleagues will have antennas to measure the properties of the plasma environment. That instrument would also help to tell you the density of very large particles in interstellar space. And my last slide is uh, just to remind you that this is an incredible opportunity. And it seems to me that the type of questions that you would answer with dust measurements of various types are of interest to a lot of communities, the planetary and space physics folks, helios physics and astrophysics colleagues as well. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. And now we're going to go to the question and answer session. Uh, so the first question is for Andrew, and it's by Daniel uh, Prieto. Is it possible for dust to be made from other sources than the ones you mentioned? Absolutely. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the types of uh, dust production that I mentioned are what we think are the dominant ones, but there are some other kind of clever or more exotic ways to produce dust. Um, <clears throat> some of the ones I could think of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, off the top of my head is if you went and looked at, say, the volcanic moon um, Io around Jupiter, we know that the volcanoes actually spit out little pieces of um, sulfur dust that uh, populate the environment around Jupiter. Another example might be the cryovolcanoes around uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus that does a similar thing, but with icy particles instead of sulfur particles um, in Saturn's system. Some of these dust grains that are produced to Jupiter Saturn are actually able to be accelerated outwards from their respective planets into interplanetary space. Um, it's a minor contribution, but it's actually a very interesting one because you can remotely sample bits of the ocean or bits of the volcanoes um, from very different locations with dust measurements. The other one I might mention is um, what's called um, asymptotic giant branch stars or AGB stars. These are stars towards the end of their life. They puff very large up and they are so large that the outer layers of the, the star's photosphere are actually just billowing off and forming dust that um, in, one, in some theories uh, is a major source of interstellar dust. Um, so there, there are definitely other types of dust we could probably have another seminar for a whole other hour to talk about all this, but um, uh, there are definitely other ones. So thank you for the question. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Andrew. And our next question is from Mike Grutman, and it's from Mihai. Are there fundamental uncertainties in understanding the charged state of A, interstellar dust grains in the local interstellar medium, and B, dust grains in the distant heliosphere greater than 10 AU? Uh, I, I am sure there are there is room for improvements, <laughs> uh, but fundamentally, at least in the solar system, when I look at plasma density and UV flux, you know, the two competing charging processes, collecting electrons and ions from the solar wind versus releasing uh, electrons due to UV radiation. Typically UV winds and naively we argue that, you know, five, six volts is the average surface potential of an isolated dust particle. And of course the potential is proportional to the charge and the radius of the particle. Uh, and because both of them roughly drops as one over R squared, I do not anticipate a tremendous variability of that uh, from the inner parts of the solar system to the outer parts of the solar system. Given, of course, that uh, there has to be a solar cycle dependence, while the entire solar spectrum changes very little, at, the, at least in the visible part, the UV part of that is changes orders of magnitude. So it could be that it is that charge would have a solar cycle dependence for maybe a, a, another volt up and down. Then if you go to the next region where you go into a shock hot plasma, I am pretty sure that would rely on the models or the model calculations, what exactly is the plasma temperature and density at the outs, at the heliospheric boundary. And then naively, as we go back out to the, to the, you know, further away from the local interaction with our solar system and uh, the galactic environment, I imagine UV would win again. And, uh, but that depends again on the, on the plasma environment. I naively suspect that uh, it's going to be a few words positive, but uh, Bruce Drain or some other folks spend more time pondering about uh, the environmental conditions. All I can report to you that if we were to know the plasma environment and the UV environment, our models for charging are reasonably sturdy and have been verified in various lab uh, experiments. Thank you very much, Mihai. And our next question is from Neil Turner. What angular resolution must the 100 micron measurements have to adequately determine the dust distribution? What constraints does this put on the mapping instrument? Mihai, could you take this question? I think that question is to Andrew. Or, oh, Andrew, uh, do you want to comment? <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's a good question. The the angular requirements, I think, for the infrared mapper are perhaps not overly strict, uh, and part of that comes from the fact that the the dust distribution is fairly um, broad. Uh, much of the variation is actually just probably from looking in the ecliptic plane to vantage points that perhaps look towards the ecliptic pole. Um, the, the dust dynamics models that I work on don't necessarily uh, predict very fine structured featured uh, details that you'd need to pull out. Um, I will confess that I am not an observing scientist myself. I might have to defer some of the very detailed uh, angular resolution questions to somebody like Casey um, or others. Um, but, but off the top of my head, I think there are not overly strong constraints because we're not looking at very fine detailed um, features. Uh, Casey, I don't know if you had a, a, another thought or two to add. I have a very quick comment. Um, if we have pixels on the order of arc minutes by arc minutes, so I think we were nominally doing a five arc minute by five or 10 by 10, Neil, that will be good enough to get us the structure we need. We don't need arc seconds, but we also don't want degree size pixels. So finer than Kobe, but um, and Derby, but no, nowhere near as fine as the, uh, uh, as modern like Spitzer or, or JWST. Thank you very much, Casey and Andrew. And that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you very much to our panelists and thank you for attending today's webinar. Please visit the Interstellar Probe website for more information about the study and to view information on future webinars and events. Also, please consider signing up on our listserv under the community involvement section of the website to make sure you're getting the latest information on upcoming webinars and events. Thanks for joining us and have a wonderful day.